right, are we on? I think we're on. So the pulsing techno music ends and I begin. Hey everyone, we're here talking about Blazor today, so if you're interested in learning more about that, you are in the right place. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my friends at Plain Concepts for inviting me to be here, and I'd like to thank my employer, Microsoft, for letting me be here. Uh, so my name is Ryan Nowak. I'm a developer and architect on the ASP.NET Core team. Uh, if you've used ASP.NET Core, you probably have used a lot of things that I have worked on. Uh, I have been a part of the ASP.NET Core effort since the beginning of .NET Core and since the beginning of uh, ASP.NET Core, and my focus mainly has been on frameworks, languages, uh, Razor, MVC, things that people use, but I also do a lot of infrastructure kinds of things as well. So if you see me around the conference later today, I'd be happy to talk with you about Blazor or anything else .NET, ASP.NET Core. Uh, if you want my presentation materials, you can find them at that URL. They're already up there if you want to look. So today we're here to talk about Blazor. Hopefully you've heard a little bit about this so far. You might have gone to Scott Hunter's talk, or you might have heard about Blazor through some other channel. Blazor is a new UI framework that's simple and easy to use for the web. It is a component-based framework that is, implemented, that is influenced by JavaScript frameworks like Angular, React, and Vue.js. And I'd like to think that we maybe mix those things up and learn some lessons from the things that they tried and took the parts that make the most sense in C Sharp. Blazor is the next evolution of Razor and adds a bunch of really powerful capabilities to the language that you can use when writing components. So if you've done Razor UI before, if you've done MVC, you've probably seen things like partial views and tag helpers and all those kinds of things. Well, Blazor, Blazor's capabilities for writing and composing great UI kind of blow those things out of the water. Lastly, Blazor is a framework that runs in the browser, and it has two hosting modes, on the client or on the server. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means pretty soon. But know that in both of those modes, Blazor is a real .NET experience, which means you can use .NET standard libraries, uh, anything out there that doesn't have an operating system dependency or runs on .NET standard 2.0. You can use even when we're talking about running in the Blazor or in the browser. Sorry. Uh, and lastly, Blazor allows you to interoperate with JavaScript, which means that you can use web components, you can use JavaScript libraries if they meet your use case, like a charting library or a mapping library, or any of those powerful kinds of web things that are available today. You can use and compose with your Blazor apps. So we're going to jump right into some demos, because I don't know how many of you have had a chance to really see what this is like before, and I want you to get a feel for what the Blazor experience is like. So I'm going to pull up Visual Studio here. And I have got a simple Blazor project that I created from the template. And this is a client-side project, meaning that all the code here that's going to run in the browser. Oh, what do I have to do? OK. It's what? OK, take it off. Yeah. Okay. What? I closed it. So how do I project this? Duplicate? How about now? Yes. Okay. We're going. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that I was on screen off. So let's get back into things. So I've got this simple app here, and I just created this from the new project template. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to click around and I'm going to navigate through this UI. And what do you notice, or what do you don't notice? Well, you probably don't notice a lot of page refreshes happening, even though I'm navigating inside of this app. And the reason is because all of that is running on the client side. So there's no request going to the server when I click back and forth between these pages. There's no network hop happening. It's all being run on the client in this case. Notice what else I can do. I can come to this page here, and I can click this counter button, or this click me button, and you can see that count go up. And I'm going to tell you that I didn't write any JavaScript to do this. I only wrote .NET. So if we take a look at the code here, I've got that counter page code. And you can see that I have some simple HTML here. And I have got this like special event handler here on this button. I've got this app on click thing with an increment count. And you notice that if I hover this, this is a .NET method, right? So I can wire up this .NET increment count method to this JavaScript event handler on click, or this event handler looking thing. And then when I click that button, it's just going to increment that count. So to prove to you that this is what's really happening, let's do, let's do something a little bit different. Let's change this code, and I'm going to add a parameter here. Now, a parameter 
is the way that you pass data into a component, and it's a way that you can sort of configure and pass around components to build rich abstractions inside your application that are going to work for you. And I'm going to call this increment amount. So I'm going to make an increment amount parameter, and that's just a property. And this is something that can be set by things who use this component. So I'm just going to auto format this. And then instead of incrementing by one, I'm going to increment by the increment amount. Now, if I come back out here to this index page, I'm going to take that counter component, and I'm just going to drop it in here. And I want to do this to prove to you that these components, this file that you see here, this .razor file, is just a normal .NET class that gets compiled. And you can use them from markup if they are a component. So I'll take my counter, and I can just put that here. And you notice I have completion and IntelliSense. And I have completion and IntelliSense for this increment amount. And let's set that to 10. So now I can rebuild this and refresh in my browser. And it's going to start, once I refresh this, it's going to start incrementing by 10. Or not. Oh, because it's on the home page. So it's incrementing by 10 now. So you can see I can write .NET code. I can update .NET code. I can define components and classes. I can combine them, and I can use them together in the browser. It's just your .NET code running. Let's look at something a little bit different. I have this fetch data page that's going to fetch some weather data. Now, this is not the data for Madrid, um, as we can see looking at some of these temperatures. In fact, it's not the data for anywhere real. It's all just random numbers. But uh, what, I, what I can show you with the code of this data or with the behavior of this page is you notice when I refresh and I click on this guy, it's going to kind of like pop in there, right? Like it doesn't load immediately because it's loading asynchronously. So if I come back to my code, you I'm going to open up this fetch data page. And you can see here that I've got an HTTP client. So I'm using the, this at inject directive, which is a directive that's available in Razor today, inside of a component to get an HTTP client from the dependency injection container. And then I'm using that HTTP client down here to asynchronously get some data. And I'm going to populate that inside this little table. So that's what's going on here. I can use things like HTTP client. I can use all the power of .NET uh, inside the browser to make an interactive client UI. So jumping back in here. Oh, press the wrong button. So how does this work? Let's, let's think about how this works and, and how, how we can get .NET running in the browser. You may or may not have heard of WebAssembly so far. WebAssembly is a new standards-based browser technology that is, you can think of like a low-level bytecode for things that want to run in the browser. Just like .NET has the common instruction language, WebAssembly is a similar kind of bytecode to the common instruction language that lets things that aren't, Jav that aren't JavaScript run and work in the browser. So how would we think about getting .NET into WebAssembly? Well, we could run .NET on WebAssembly if we compiled an implementation of .NET to WebAssembly. And that's what Blazor on the client side is right now. We've taken the mono JavaScript uh, .NET runtime, and we've compiled that to WebAssembly. And then we have a piece of JavaScript there that loads that WebAssembly component from mono into the browser and runs your .NET code on top. So if we look at this. I'm going to bring my app back up, and I'm going to bring up the network tab. And I realize that it's a little cramped in here, so this might be kind of hard to see. But when I refresh the page, you're going to see a bunch of things fly by here. And what you can see is you can see at the, up at the top, when I get to the top, you're going to find mono.wasm and mono.js. So we've actually got the mono runtime compiled to WebAssembly that we're going to pull down and run in the browser. And then we've got a bunch of DLLs for your ASP.NET Core dependencies and your Blazor dependencies, as well as this Hello.NET Spain app, which is the app DLL in this case. So what are some things that are good about this? What are some things that are good about getting mono in WebAssembly in the browser? Well, first of all, there's no plugins here, right? Like, this is just a WebAssembly file, which is a standard, uh, standard browser kind of thing. Secondly, you're running with the browser security model, which I want to convince you is actually a good thing. So some of the problems with Silverlight and Flash that have happened over the years are lots of security problems or apps trying to do things they shouldn't. But WebAssembly inside the browser runs with the browser's permissions and the browser's security model. So you can't really do things that you shouldn't. You can't break somebody's app, and you, or you can't break somebody's computer, and you can't really get out of there. So how does this all fit together? So we said we have Blazor here. We've got WebAssembly, which is provided by all of the browsers, even the mobile ones. On top of that, next layer in our cake, we have .NET. In this case, it's mono compiled to WebAssembly. And then the next layer on top of that, we've got your Razor components or your app 
running as regular DLLs. And how that works is you've got your HTML DOM inside the browser where we can get events from the DOM, like our on-click event, and then we can render HTML and update the DOM and update just the parts of it that need to change efficiently so we can now interact and produce these really great web applications that run inside the browser. So I've shown you .NET on top of WebAssembly running in the client with mono.wasm and with your DLLs. We also have another hosting model for Blazor that we call server-side. And I want to spend a little time talking about server-side and how it's different from client, and then we're going to do a bigger, richer coding demo after that. So I've got another app here that is a server-side app, and I'm going to go ahead and fire this up and point out some differences. So here's my server-side app, and as usual, I've got a counter button. There's always a counter button in these demos. And I'm going to go to the network tab, and I'm going to highlight this WebSockets thing, and then I'm going to go ahead and do a reload. And you can see that I've opened a WebSocket here, and if I click on this, you can see over in this little pane all the binary messages, all the WebSocket messages that are exchanged between the client and the server. And so when I click this button, it's sending messages over that WebSocket. And the reason why that's happening is because my .NET code is running in a .NET Core server process on the server, and none of my .NET code actually has to make it all the way down to the browser, which has some advantages and some disadvantages, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Another thing that I want to show you about this is that when we come back over to the network tab, and let's do the all again, and I reload this page, I'll kill this little window here, is you're not going to see mono.wasm or any of those DLLs be downloaded because they all stay on the server. So we can, we can write applications that actually run your code inside the browser, and you have to download the app, and it all runs right there. Or we can write your applications in such a way that your code runs on .NET Core on the server, but still gives you the same user experience and the same programming model. We'll spend a little bit more time with the server-side programming model in a bit, but just to review, we've got one framework with two hosting models. We've got the client side, and we've got the server side. So how would you think about these two things, or how might you choose for them? Well, they have different trade-offs. So on the client side, your code runs in WebAssembly in the browser, so you've got to download all that code, right? It's all got to get there. And the download size could be kind of big. Right now, it's around 2 megs for a small app with, uh, with the client side hosting model, and that scales pretty well. On the server side, you don't really have to download anything. You download a very small script, so the size is very small. The page that I just showed you there, it's got a big JavaScript file that's not part of Blazor, but the, the average server-side app is probably going to be on the order of, three, of 300 to 400 kilobytes when you include everything that the framework has. Um, the other thing about the server-side model is that all the state lives on the server. Uh, and that's kind of got some good and some bad aspects to it. There's a trade-off there. So in the server-side model, since your code runs and lives on the server, you can do normal server things. You can open a connection to the database. You can write to the file system. You can listen to a message queue. You could, you could make a TCP connection. You can do any of those kind of things you want. Inside the client-side hosting model, you can't really do any of those things because they're not allowed in browsers. Browsers can't open random TCP connections. They can't write to the file system. They can't connect to your database. So you have a trade-off there. The other thing that I want to mention about what's going on with Blazor and what's the plan for it is that the server-side model is going to ship in .NET Core 3.0. So .NET Core 3.0 is coming in this September. Hopefully you've heard a lot about .NET Core 3.0 already and you're kind of excited about it. The server-side model is coming in this September. The client-side model is going to take a little longer to get done because it requires us to make a production quality WebAssembly runtime, which we are very hard at work on right now. Uh, the other thing to mention about this that I want you to take away from thinking about these two release dates is that the programming model and the tools and the definition of components and the way that everything is going to work or the way that you build applications is being stabilized right now and it's going to ship in .NET Core 3.0. So I would expect some things to get a little bit better and get a little bit smarter and get a little bit faster for Blazor on the client side. Uh, but, but we think that the majority of the Blazor programming model is pretty ready and is going to be available very soon. So I mentioned .NET 5, and hopefully Scott told you a lot about .NET 5 this morning. The takeaway for Blazor is that in the Blazor context, .NET 5 is about having production quality WebAssembly support, and that includes the ability to compile .NET assemblies to WebAssembly where necessary or where prudent. Okay, so additionally, uh, if you've been following Blazor for a while, we've been, late, we've been giving Blazor the label of experiment for a very long time. We've been saying that it's an official experiment or an experimental web framework. I want to make that totally clear that it's not an experiment, it's a committed shipping product that's shipping in 3.0. 
Uh, Blazor for client side, if that's what you're into, is gonna continue to get updates and continue to get fixes and improvements and previews uh, while we're on that journey to 5.0. So that is the majority of my slides. Uh, and we're gonna spend the rest of the time just learning about some Blazor and teaching you uh, how these kinds of things work and how you build some real apps. So with that said, the standard way to start, let's not leave a comment, the standard way to think about starting a demo for a SPA framework is of course to build a to-do application. And so we're gonna build a to-do application. So I'm gonna take this existing app and I'm gonna paste in some markup that I've already prepared. I have one ready sitting over here in the oven. So I've got a very simple HTML form here for entering some to-do items. I've got a very simple little area to list my to-do items and I've got some C-sharp code that I'm gonna put down here inside this code block. So you may or may not have heard of code or functions before. Code is kind of new, functions is kind of old, but they serve the same purpose. They're both a place to put your class members or your helper functions or any functionality that you wanna define for Razor files. So functions actually been around for a long time, hasn't been that used very much, hasn't gotten a lot of love in the Razor world, uh, and I think, I think you'll see why um, it's more useful for Blazor when we start writing some code. So I've got some state here for this component. I've got a list of items, I've got an item that I'm editing right now, and I've got the ability to sort items, and then I have this method here that I'm gonna use when an item is submitted. So I've got my markup, I've got a little uh, display here, and I've got some state, and the only thing left to do is to wire them up. So I've got two text boxes, title and description, and I wanna make these do something. And the way that you would associate an input field or something like this with a value in Blazor is you would use this at bind directive attribute. So whenever you see a attribute on an element or a component that begins with at, know that there's some power there. This is some, some special compiler functionality that goes beyond just setting an attribute. So I'm gonna at bind this. And I wanna bind the value of this text box to my to do item that I'm editing. And specifically, since this is the title box, to the title. And you can see that I get completion and IntelliSense for all of these things that seems to mostly work. So let's do the same thing here for the description. So I can put in item.description and that will again mostly work. Sorry about that. Again, this is preview. This is a preview version of Visual Studio. We hope to have these things ironed out before it is ready. So up on here, I wanna handle submission of the form and I'm gonna do that by defining a .NET event handler for on submit. So I define my on submit handler and I'm gonna go ahead and put in my submit function that I've defined right down here, this on submit method. So there's my on submit. And then the other thing that I haven't done here, this is my form that's going to accept input. I haven't done anything here that's actually gonna display it. And the way that you can do this in Razor is really simple. If you haven't done Razor before, it's really easy. You just mix markup and control flow or statements or other C-sharp constructs. So I can just drop to a for each here and I can for each to do in items and then I can drop back to HTML and I can say to do dot title separated by to do, I got a typo there, to do dot description. This should be items. I should be good to go. And then the last thing that I wanna do here that I haven't done yet is I have this little sort dropdown and I have this little sort variable, but I haven't associated that with anything, so let's go ahead and bind that up too, and I'm gonna bind that to sort. And then to actually do the sorting, I've got a little piece of helper code that I already wrote. It's not very interesting. So I'm gonna sort my items according to the sort order, and that should be good to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this, and you'll see that I've got a working form here that's interactive, that's gonna preserve state, that's gonna run inside the client. Uh, and it's gonna feel like a JavaScript application or feel like your React level spa. So here's what I need to do. I need to give my talk, say I hope it works. And if I submit that, you can see it's added there, right? Um, what's, what's another thing I need to do? I need to go back to the hotel, I can put that there, and that's also gonna be added to the list, and I can sort these, and all that functionality kind of works, just like I had written a JavaScript application or just like this is running inside the web. Now I wanna remind you all that this is the server side model. So there's, none of my .NET code is actually running in the browser, it's all running on the server and it all kind of feels the same as if it were running inside the browser. So let's do something else. 
I'm going to add a couple things to this, and I'm going to make the UI a little bit prettier. But before I do that, I want to refactor this code, and I want to introduce some use reusable abstractions here. Because what do we like to do? We like to refactor our code. We like to make it clean. We like to make it nice. So I'm going to go ahead and add some other components here, and then I'm going to refactor my editor and my list into some reusable components. So I'm going to create a to-do editor, and I'm creating a razor component, which is with the file extension .razor. So there's my to-do editor component and I'm going to create a to-do display component. So new item here, and I'll call this one to-do display. It's where I'm going to put that little table that I had built. So let's see what it's like to refactor code into these components. Well, inside my index page here, this is my form, and I'm just going to grab all this stuff, and I'm going to put it inside my to-do editor because that's my editor. And then lastly, I need somewhere to define this on submit and this item variable. I need, I need to get these things. And the way that I can do that is I can pass these values in from whoever's hosting this to-do editor because I want to I keep this isolated. I want to make this focused on just showing the UI and just handling that form post. So I've already prepared these parameters here. And I'm going to paste in a onSubmit callback and a to-do item. Now, event callback, don't get too worried about that. That is a Blazor-defined type that kind of acts like a delegate, acts like an action, acts like a func. You could use standard .NET delegates for this, but event callback is a little bit more powerful and has a few tricks up its sleeve, so we tend to use that when doing Blazor. Uh, likewise, for my to-do display, I'm going to grab all this markup down here, and I'm going to pass that in to my to-do display. So paste that in. I've got some parameters here ready to go. So inside the to-do display, I'm going to create the sort, and I'm going to have a parameter for the list of items, and I think I should have something to fix up here because the casing of that has changed. So here's my to-do display. And then to use these, these, these components that I've defined in these separate files have now just become like tags. Like I can just use these. And it's all based on C-sharp namespace rules. If I wanted to, I could fully qualify this. Like I could say Razor components, material design, server app, to-do display. I could fully qualify that if I wanted to. I want to drive home the point that these are really just C-sharp classes at the end of the day. Uh, but I'll go ahead and throw in my to-do editor. And then the variables that I need to pass to that, I need to pass the current item. And I need to pass that on submit handler. So I defined on submit there. And I have my on submit method here. And when this on submit, when this thing is rendered, it's going to pass this delegate for this on submit method into my to-do editor component. Then when the, that user submits the form, it's going to invoke the delegate, which is going to update the state of this component. So if you think about authoring components, a really standard pattern is data in, events out. If you've heard about React, if you've heard about unidirectional state flow, that kind of idea is going to start to sound really familiar, doesn't it? Uh, so let's go ahead and throw in our to-do display. So I have my to-do display here, and the thing that I need to pass in here is the whole list of items, which I have in this variable right here. And I don't need this sort anymore because it's now defined inside that to-do display. I've defined an abstraction, and I've abstracted away the fact that this list is even sortable to begin with. So if I launch this up, it's not going to be very interesting because it's the same, right? It's the same UI you saw before, and I can prove that this has the same functionality. I'm going to prove this works, and it works. Great. So that's not very interesting. But what if we could make this UI a little bit better? So I have got a library here that I've defined. And I'm not going to go deep into this library or what's in here and how it works due to time constraints. But what I wanted to sort of express about this is it's Google's material design library. So if you've seen material design before, if you've heard of material design, or if you've used a component library in the past, people in the JavaScript world write web components, right? They write these bundles of HTML and CSS and JavaScript that look really nice or have a certain behavior when they're on a page. And like maybe you've sort of gotten in that party in the past, but it has a little too much JavaScript for you, a little bit more than you'd like to do. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could use some of those web components from Blazor? I'm here to tell you that you can. What's great about this is that one person has to do the work one time to create this library. And then everybody in the .NET community can benefit from that. And we can wrap and reuse these JavaScript and HTML components as long as they're pretty well behaved. They will just work in your Blazor app. So I'm going to drop in some markup that I've already prepared here. And I've just got a more components here. I've got a text field with a label of title. I've got a text field with a label of description. And I've got a submit button. And this should be you know, kind of semantically equivalent to what I had before. And again, these, this is all going to map to normal HTML at the end of the day. It's all going to ultimately create input fields that are going to talk to this form. But I've abstracted away all the styling, and I've abstracted away the complication of hooking up those JavaScript libraries. 
Likewise, in here, inside my to-do display, I've got a customized display for this as well. And I'm using this MDC list uh, component here, which is a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to unpack everything that's here in the interest of time, but what I want you to see and focus on is this actions parameter here. And what I'm doing is passing in a template to be rendered by this list component. So we call these templated components or template parameters. You can think of this like a lambda, but it's a lambda that returns HTML or a lambda that does rendering. So we're going to specify some content for each item in this list. So if I run this again, you're going to see that the UI has just gotten a lot more exciting, right? So this is taking a little bit of time. It's doing building. It's thinking about restoring on the Wi-Fi that's struggling under the load and really just, just doing its best. It's taking its time here. Let's see if I've hit that IIS. Let's see if I've hit that IIS bug. I have hit that IIS bug. Again, this is preview software. I hope everybody enjoys a good demo fail. In this case, it's just, uh, just have to kill the server and restart because I've got a file locked there. And you can see now when I pop this up, it's a little bit more fancy. Ooh, look at that, right? Ooh, that's nice. Like, show off cool UI, right? People seem to like it. I can add it, and I've got this cool list. Let's see, add another item. And I, got, I can sort these items still. They're still in the same list like they were before. And I've added this little check mark here so I can check all of those off and have the UI update. Ooh, that's nice, isn't it? Like, you can build all this, this fancy, fancy UI. And it, it didn't take a lot of code to do that, right? What it took is somebody to take this material design library, somebody to take that CSS and JavaScript, and figure out a really nice .NET way to package that. And I'm just using it. I am just made a little, just made a little uh, template here with a little text box and a little check mark. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. So we, have, we, we can notice another problem here, right? So I've added these items, and they're really important. I have to do all these things, and I want to remember them. You can see that they're not done, and I'm worried that I'll forget. But I've got a problem. My problem is when I refresh the page, they go away. So I should persist this data somewhere, right? Well, the good news is that we're doing server-side Blazor, and we're running on the server. So let's say I wanted to put those items in a database. Well, since I'm running on server-side Blazor and I'm just in .NET Core, I could just use my database. And the way that I can do that is I can get my DB context. So I can get an EF DB context here, and I can just inject that into this class. And I'm going to replace, I'm not, I'm, this is not an EF tutorial, so we're not going to analyze the database code in detail, but I can replace my onSubmit logic was something I've written earlier. And I will, I will step through it just briefly. So I'm going to load the items from the database when this component gets initialized. That's what this on init async is. So the list of items is going to be empty until they get loaded. And then they'll, they'll show again as loaded when I update this when this on init async completes. Uh, when I see an item submitted, I'm going to add it to my DB context. And then I'm going to save changes and reload the items. We'll talk about this in a second. And this is just my EF code to load items. The other thing that I have to do here is that this is now async. Uh, this was the void returning synchronous method before, and now it's async. Like, who thinks that I can do that? I can make a click handler async. Like, this is .NET after all, so I can just make it async, and it all just works. So it's not complicated to do async with Blazor. In fact, we assume that you're going to do it, because the whole point of applications is to have data. And data usually means going async either to make an HTTP request or to, uh, or to talk to your database. So if I run this again, I want to prove to you again that these items will, in fact, be persisted in the database. So we're loading, loading, loading. Say, check, database, works. These get less creative as I get further in the demo. Sorry about that. So let's do a refresh, and we're back. We're now saving it to the database. Just injected my DB context into my component, and I can just save it just like that because I'm running on the server. Uh, one other thing that I haven't fixed yet is uh, this is a bug, this to-do check mark. If I check that off and I save it, nothing is happening because I haven't written any code to handle that case. So let's write some code to handle that case. As we said, uh, data in, events out. So I'll go to my to-do editor, and I need to hook something up, or sorry, my to-do display, and I need to hook something up to this switch. I'm binding the checked value of this switch, which means I'm visually checking off that is done item, but I'm not doing anything to my data store when it happens. There's nothing here that's saying you need to save the item because it's changed. So I'm going to go ahead and add that. And I'm going to declare a new parameter here, and it's going to be an event callback, which we're already a little bit familiar with. And I'm going to call this on item changed. Again, data in, events out. I'm going to get the event out, 
And the way that I wire up that up here is that this guy has defined an on change parameter and I'm just gonna pass in my on item change parameter. And you can see that I'm sort of just chaining this parameter all the way down, right? Ultimately, there's some HTML input element that has this attached to it that came from here that's gonna come from here once I add it. And so I have on item changed is defined here. And then I have on item changed, on item change async, which is this little method that I've defined right here. So now when I check that checkbox, you should see that whether or not I've done something uh, will be saved to the database, which helps you uh, defeat um, existential horror of completing things and seeing that they're not done. So let's go ahead and kill IIS again because it's not cooperating with me, and this should load right up. So let's test this out again and let's see if my database really works. And I can check that off now because it really is complete. Yes, it actually works. Okay, so since we're talking databases, I know that my database is running, on, is running uh, locally for me, but like who's ever had a database that's been slow or a database that's like in another data center or far away? Like it'd be nice if we could show some sort of visual indicator while we're doing our database work. And since my database is really fast because I'm doing local development right now, I'm just gonna simulate what happens um, when my database is slow by adding a little bit of delay here to my UI. I'm not gonna check this in um, because that would be bad. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna show some sort of visual progress while my database operation is happening. And the way that I like to do that is I'd like to show a little dialogue or show a little progress bar, something to tell the user like, okay, we're, we're handling your work, we're doing it. Uh, if I look down at my handy little components library here, uh, the material design components define dialogues. They define progress bars. They have things like this. So since I have these Blazor wrappers around those, I can just use those. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop a dialog on here. So I'm gonna drop this dialog, and I've got my little MDC dialog here. It's gonna say loading your to-dos. And then the thing that I need to fix here, the thing that it's complaining about is I need some way to interact with this dialog. I need some way to tell it that it should show and hide itself. Now we've seen interacting with components through passing parameters, but there's another way that I could interact with this component. I could just call some methods on it, and that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm going to define a field here, and it's gonna be of type MDC dialog, and I'm going to call it dialog. So this is going to align with this new directive that I've added here, where I've got this weird at ref thing, and it says in there dialog, and what that's gonna do is when this renders, it's gonna grab the instance of MDC dialog and it's gonna assign it to this field so that I can interact with it and I can call methods on it. Again, these are just .NET classes, so you can define your own functionality and do whatever you want. Now, when I submit an item, I'm gonna go ahead and show the dialog and I'm gonna fire and forget this because otherwise it would be blocking until the dialog completes. So this is gonna be dialog.showAsync and then down here at the end, I'm going to await dialog dot hide async. And this dialog should come up when I start submitting my database operation, and it should go away once it's completed. I'm gonna go ahead and launch this and test if our database is working. So let's add another to-do item. We're going to test the dialog description. Uh, this will be cool. I love progress bars. Who doesn't? And there we go, we have our little dialogue, we have our progress bar, that's all, that's all working and, and easy to do. So how did I do that, how does this work? Well, I've got this M MDC dialogue here, which is my material design dialogue, and I'm, again, the same pattern, I'm passing in content, I'm composing what I want to show inside this dialogue. You can think about defining a dialogue component, and a dialogue component that didn't let you specify the content wouldn't be very useful, would it? So inside of here, I'm just defining a little progress bar that's just gonna show when it's going on. If I wanted to make this more sophisticated, I could add a cancel button or do, do various things like that if I wanted to. So let's pause this for now, and I'm gonna go back to my slideware. So we've seen how, it's, how it is to create a Blazor eight. Uh, Blazor UI and how easy it can be to wire up event handlers, to define your own components, to compose UI, to reuse component libraries and build on top of things that other people have done. 
Um, we've also played around with the two different hosting models. We've seen Blazor running in the client, which we did a very brief demo of in the beginning, and we've seen Blazor on the server running over SignalR and talking to the DOM, doing those updates sort of remotely. And again, we've seen that these are kind of the same programming model. You have the same components, you have the same syntax, you have the same Razor language working between these two. And we've seen that in the server-side model, you can do all the things that servers can do, like use your entity framework or use your file system or any of those kinds of things like that. Um, what about integration with other ASP.NET Core features? Is, that there, is there more that we can do with ASP.NET Core to sort of enrich our experience here? Well, I wouldn't ask the question if the answer wasn't yes. The answer is yes. Uh, so going back to my application here, I've defined a very humdrum sort of Razor Pages old school version of this UI. Yeah, it's boring, right? I have my little list of to-dos here, um, and I'm just showing a really simple HTML form. If we look at the code for this, it's hiding away in this little folder. I've got a Razor page here with a for each loop rendering my to-do items, and I've got an index CSHTML that has got my DB context, and I'm just getting my items, and I'm showing them there. Wouldn't it be nice if we could reuse that UI we just defined and add some of our like, more interactive features to this old school Razor page? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, now, the syntax for this is not the best. Um, it's kind of a work in progress, but this is the way it's going to be, at least for right now. And I've added some methods to HTML helper. So I can await now an HTML render component async. And so I can reach out and grab any of those components that I've defined and sort of plop them on here. And the one that I want right now is I want my to-do display because I am in the business of displaying some to-dos. And then for my to-do display to work, I have to pass it the list of items to show, which I already have. So remember inside my index page, I got my list of items right here in this onget, mat, this onget uh, handler, which means that they're available as a property on my model inside Razor. So the way that I pass those in is the same way I pass a lot of things to HTML helpers. I just define an anonymously typed object, and I can say items equals model.items, which is where I put them on the, on the Razor page. And so now, if I, if I launch this guy up again, you should see my interactive UI, my sortable list of items is going to show up uh, on my Razor page once I stop IAS's madness. Sorry. All right, here we go. So let me go over to my little Razor page, and you can see I've got my, got my Blazor UI showing up here, and I can sort and interact with these things. Uh, and that will all just work. Now, the database part of this is not going to work because I haven't hooked up that event handler. If I wanted to hook that up to a database, I could. The other neat thing about this is I've actually passed in the list of items here. So what happens when you, what happens when you render an interactive component like this in server-side mode is that we create that little hive of state, and we keep what you pass to us and make that available for the client to connect to with SignalR and access the state. So the only way that these items were passed in he was here during the static rendering of this Razor page, then I can open a connection to, from the browser to the server and interact with the state that I just created, which is pretty neat. So if we look at what's here, what you're going to see in the sources view, and I'm not going to the elements view, I'm going to the sources view, because the sources view gives you what was the actual source file returned from the server. And I'm going to make this the star of the show here, because I want you to see that this is all the markup that's produced from these components, and you're not recognizing it, and that's Material Design's fault, not, not ours, not Blazor's. But when we get down into the meat of it, you'll, you'll see down here that we've got our, we've got our actual to-dos showing up in this list. And the fact that this is in the sources page should tell you that all of this markup was statically generated on the server. So all of this markup was actually rendered when I went to my Razor page, totally static. Uh, so you can use these components in a way that they just produce static markup, you can use these components in a way that they just produce interactive behavior, or you can use them in a way that does both, which is what I'm showing you right here. Another thing that you may have noticed with this app is that literally anybody can come to this app and can, can see all my to-dos. So it'd be really nice. I have, I have login buttons up here, and I already have authentication configured for this site. But it'd be really nice if I could just limit access to this site to people who should have access instead of being open to everybody. Now, the way that I would do that in my Razor Pages app is I could use the startup-based experience for configuring Razor Pages, or I could come here and I could just drop a I could just drop an authorize attribute on here, um, and then now that's gonna that's gonna redirect people to the login page on my Razor Pages app. Um, 
could I do the same thing for a server-side Blazor? I can. So inside here, I can use this new attribute directive. And I can use this to put any, put any attribute I want on here. So I'm just going to drop an authorize attribute on here. Now, this isn't going to be a super friendly experience, because what's going to happen is instead of sort of coming to my landing page, we're going to come to the, we're going to come to the login screen right away, which is not what I want. So it just tells me I'm not authorized right away. That's not very friendly. What I'd really like to do, since this is the landing page of my app, is I'd like to like conditionally show you the to do's. So if you're logged in, you can see everything. If you're not logged in, you'll get sort of a friendly message to log in. And I can use a built-in component that's provided in, as part of Blazor to do that. And it's called the authorize view. This is another templated component. And the, the content that I'm taking in here is what content do I want to show you if you're not authorized? And what content do I want to show you if you are authorized? And I'm going to delete this because I'm not blocking access to the page. So if you're not authorized, you're going to see thanks for your interest, but you need to be logged in. You know, go away or log in. Uh, if you are authorized, I basically want you to see everything that's here already. So I'm going to grab this markup, paste it down here at the bottom, format everything, and then now all of our content of our existing page is surrounded by this authorized tag. So now if I launch this, it should show me that I'm not logged in, and that's why I can't see the to-dos. Then if I want to log in, then I should be able to see them. And I can do conditional display of UI and all those nice kind of things. Now, I could use this. I'm just using the basic policy here. I'm saying you have to be logged in. I could use roles. I could use claims. I could use any of the things that you already know from ASP.NET's uh, server-side authentication primitives. So I'll go ahead and click log in. I've already set up a username and password for this. And I'm back at my to-do site. If I log out, you can see everything changes just sort of instantly. I don't have to navigate. I don't have to do anything like that. So you can see how I can use a bunch of other ASP.NET Core features in tandem with Blazor. I can use my components that I've written for Blazor from my Razor pages in a static way or an, in, in an interactive way. And I can compose some rich and powerful interactive UI that feels like a spa but has the power of ASP.NET Core on the server. I'm going to flip back over to my slides. So we've seen all this. We've seen that. Now, the way that this works, just to review, is when you, when you load up that page, you create those components and you create that state. It gets sent to the client as static HTML. And there's enough information in that HTML for the client to connect back to the server and open that SignalR connection that you see tunneling through there in the middle. And then you can get that interactive mode. You can reconnect to that state, and it becomes a fully interactive thing that you can click around or you can make state changes on the server. So let's talk about the schedule. Where are we with .NET Core 3? Well, .NET Core 3 Preview 6 is out now. We've seen a couple new Preview 6 features in here, and I'm showing you Preview 6 features as well as uh, the current preview of Visual Studio. We're going to have a Preview 7, which is a Go Live release, in July. There's going to be a couple more previews in there after the Go Live release. And then we're going to have the GA, or the final release of 3.0, in September. It's not listed here, but there's going to be an ASP.NET Core and a .NET Core 3.1 that's coming in November that's going to be like a sort of polish and quality of life release. And that will be an LTS release, meaning that you can buy a support contract if you're an LTS kind of customer. Blazor for WebAssembly, or Blazor on the client, is going to continue to get updates after .NET Core 3 ships because it's one programming model and one system. They all evolves together. Uh, and the GA for Blazor on the client side will probably be around the .NET 5 timeframe when the runtime is more mature. A couple other resources here. So I just got back from Oslo, lovely Oslo, where I was at the NDC Oslo conference, and I taught a two-day workshop with Steve Sanderson, who created Blazor. Uh, you can go to this workshop, and you can try this. You just need the latest preview of .NET Core and the latest preview of Visual Studio. And you can build an app that's pretty similar to what you've shown here that's as powerful. And it will make you really, really hungry for pizza. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about Blazor, this is set up in a sort of tutorial format. There's docs. There's information. Uh, teaches you the concepts and walks you through building your first Blazor application. Uh, lastly, kinds of things that are in Preview 6, that it's the current release, that are relative, relevant to Blazor. So the authentication and authorization stuff, the stuff you saw at the end, the fact that I can log in to my Blazor application, the fact that I have components and features of Blazor that I can use for authentication and authorization, that's all new in Preview 6. Uh, at namespace, giving you control over what namespace the classes go uh, when you generate your Razor files. 
at code uh, replacement for at functions or sort of a more memorable name for at functions in this preview. Uh, directive attributes, which you saw, the bind and the on click, those have had their syntax change and become a little bit more powerful in this release. We have another feature here for embedded static content that I think we'll probably blog about uh, if, we, if we haven't already pretty soon. Uh, we have a recipe now that we've, Blazor motivated us to add to package static content, your JavaScript, your CSS, uh, anything that you, that you need in a package in a way that works with local development, so multi-project static content with one web app, or uh, transparently publishes with your app when you do a publish to, to deploy it, or works when you package your library as a library and distribute it to others. So we've created what we think is a really good recipe for having static content that ships with .NET code, and we think that that's really important for people being able to build libraries that are reusable and valuable, like the material design library that I showed here. I'm not gonna talk too much in detail about Key because it's kind of advanced and complicated. Um, you, could go, you could go read about it, I'm sure, in the release notes for Preview 6. So some other links, if you wanna try Blazor, uh, the best place to get information, get Getting started instructions is blazor.net. Um, you can also use blazor.net to get to the docs. Um, Visual Studio, .NET Core, all good things, and so is the workshop. So that's what I've got. That's, that's everything that I have. Um, thank you for listening and being a good audience. I'm happy, I'm happy to take a few questions if there are questions, or I can hang around for a little bit and talk to people if, if anybody's got questions. She's going to come around with the microphone, I think. Hi. Um, can you mix uh, the two hosting models in the same application? So, that's, so, so what he asked was, can you mix the two hosting models in the same application? That's an interesting question, and it's one that we've gotten a lot. So let me, let me break it down into a couple of different things and talk about some possibilities. And which one you think is more interesting is going to depend on why exactly you're asking the question, I think. So you can definitely have the same components work in both hosting models. The only difference between the two hosting models is really how you do your data access. Because if you think about it, inside the browser, you're going to use HTTP to do your data access. Inside the server, you could use HTTP if you want, but it probably makes more sense to use a database. So your components in general are portable between the two hosting models. So with that said, how to further unpack this question even more? Well, if you have different areas of your site that you want to, to slice up sort of by functionality and say, like, let's say that my documentation or my marketing pages are all static, right? Um, and maybe I want to use client-side Blazor for my help in marketing pages so that they'll work offline, and it's a small amount of content, so it'd be fast to download. But I have some really valuable IP. I have a really thick business layer or domain object layer that I want to keep on the server, and I don't want to send those DLLs to the client. So you can slice your app function-wise, where it's like you click this link and you go to the client-side Blazor part of the app. You cl click this link and you go to the server-side Blazor part of the app. The, I didn't show this, uh, make too fine of a point of it when we're doing the demos, but the difference between how those two things work is literally which JavaScript file you include on the page. So if you include uh, blazor.webassembly.js, it's client. If you include blazor.server.js, it's non-client or it's server-side. If you're asking about having server-side and client-side both on the same page at the same time, I think I'd like to talk about it afterwards and understand more. Um, that's not something we'll probably have anytime soon. Thank you. And another question, uh, what about offline support? Offline support. So for server-side Blazor, there is no offline support because it relies on a connection to the server, right? So for client-side Blazor, that's fully offline by nature because it's a client-side spa. OK, thanks. Yep. Another question. Thank you for the presentation. It was very exciting to see new ways to the to the things. But I am concerned about the debug, debugging. Is it uh, like normally we debug a, cl a code, or there are differences between the server side debugging and the client side debugging? So there's a big difference between the server side and the client side debugging, and and this is one of the reasons why we're projecting client side is like a release away, whereas server side is ready now. So I didn't show it in the talk, but server side debugging is your normal .NET Core. Debugging experience, obviously, and diagnostics, because it's a server-side app. So logging, debugging, diagnostics, profiling all work the same way. Whereas client-side, you're running inside the browser. So we have some very basic functionality working inside the browser. It's a little painful to set up. 
So there's a set of steps that you can go through to either use Visual Studio or use the Chrome debugger tools to be able to debug .NET code in the browser, but it's very rudimentary at this point. I want to be honest about that. So you can step, you can inspect things like strings and integers. You can't inspect objects, um, and there's lots of features that don't work. So that's one of the reasons for that longer roadmap for client-side Blazor is having tools and diagnostics be good enough for us to put our name on and say that this is a shipping you know, Microsoft product. Thank you. Thank you. We're saying there's one, we'll take, we'll take one more, it's up there, we're almost out of time. Hi, um, can you access all the browser APIs with Blazor, like geolocation, se session, everything like that? Yes, so his question was, can you access all the browser APIs if I wanted to call geolocation or session or local storage or any of those kinds of nice APIs that the browser has? Can I do it? The answer is yes. So I didn't show it in the talk, uh, but you have interop with JavaScript. You can call JavaScript functions if you want from .NET. You can build .NET libraries that abstract over JavaScript functions so that you can call them. And that works in both server and client. So even on the server, you can do asynchronous interop. If you're running on the server and you want to put something in local storage, yes, you can do it. The state of those things right now is that you will probably have to write a little bit of JavaScript to create functions that have the signature that you want to invoke from your .NET code. Uh, what our strategy is for that is that Miguel de Casa's team, the Mono team, uh, which is now part of the .NET team, are going to be building a set of .NET libraries that wrap those JavaScript APIs and work really well in the WebAssembly story. So look for that coming uh, further down the line. We're, we're aware of the need there. Most of the time, doing JavaScript interop is really easy. Um, you, you end up defining a little JavaScript function that does specifically what you want. Or in the case of something like local storage, it's easy enough that you could just kind of invoke it with interop directly. Uh, we do support serializing objects to JavaScript uh, for interop. And we also support passing references to JavaScript so that JavaScript can call .NET methods as well. Uh, and we also support asynchronous interop with JavaScript and asynchronous interop from JavaScript to .NET. So the whole gamut of features for interop are there. Um, most of those things are pretty easy today. They're going to become very easy in the future. OK, we're out of time. Thank you, everybody.